We're going to get into our last panel on Hurricane Ian impacts and I would like to welcome the presenters up if they can join me up here on the stage. We'll start with Brandon Moody. Ooh, we got even like some hooting and hollering here. Whew. Yeah, load up on coffee and granola bars. It's going to be a, a bit of a long panel, but it's going to be incredibly interesting. So I know you'll find it worthwhile. Um, Eric Weather, Dr. Chris Anastasio, Dr. Eric Milbrandt, and it helps if we're in order. So if Brandon, you don't mind sitting here. Oh, okay. Sit in whatever order you want, then just pass the baton when you need to. Okay. So we have uh, Brandon Moody, then Eric Weather, Dr. Chris Anastasio, Dr. Eric Milbrandt, Stephanie Erickson, as well as Kayla Hayes. So we'll have all our seats filled. And then I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. Brandon Moody is the inaugural water quality manager for Charlotte County. Oh, big shoes to fill, huh? Okay, first filled in March 2021, this position is responsible for the development of the countywide water quality monitoring strategy, development of the county's water quality management plan, One Charlotte, One Water, and interdepartmental coordination of certain water quality related actions within the county. Prior to joining Charlotte County, Brandon served as the nutrient source control and water quality monitoring programs at the South Florida Water Management District and Georgia Environmental Protection Division's Watershed Planning and Monitoring Program. Dr. Chris Anastasio is the Southwest Florida Water Quality Management's Chief Water Quality Scientist and Seagrass Mapping Lead. Dr. Anastasio has been working in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed and Estuary for over 30 years, evaluating water quality, mapping seagrasses, and managing habitat restoration projects. Since 2017, Dr. Anastasio has also served as the district's Emergency Operations Center Weather Operations Unit Lead. This year, he's also taken a lead role in the district's newly established EOC Water Quality Recovery Unit. He received his PhD in 2009 from the University of South Florida's College of Marine Science, and Dr. Anastasio is also a commander of the United States Naval Reserve with 18 years of experience as a Naval Meteorological and Oceanography Officer. Dr. Eric Milbrandt received his BS from Cal Poly Humboldt and earned a PhD in biology from the University of Oregon. His research is on water quality, harmful algae blooms, and the effects of seagrass and oyster reef communities. In 2007, he established SCCF's River, Estuary, and Coastal Observing Network, otherwise known as RECON, to provide data about the dynamics of the Clusahatchee Estuary in the Gulf of Mexico. He is the director of the SCC Marine Laboratory. Eric Weather is the research administrator of FWC's Fisheries Independent Monitoring Shallow Harbor Field Laboratory. In this role, he oversees operations for a number of research projects relating to long-term fisheries monitoring, water quality data collection, habitat restoration, and the small tooth sawfish. Eric holds a BS degree in marine resource science from the University of Rhode Island. Stephanie Erickson has been with the Department of Environmental Protection for more than 15 years in the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection and is the Estero Bay Aquatic Preserve Manager. She has been the pro program lead on seagrass and water quality monitoring programs, assisting with upland management, conducted education and outreach, as well as interagency coordination activities. In her role, she oversees the office's resource management, education outreach, and resource monitoring efforts, which include water quality, oyster monitoring, seagrass, and macroalgae monitoring, and rookery monitoring. And finally, we have Kayla Hayes, who is an environmental specialist with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection at the Shaw Harbor Aquatic Preserve. Uh, and I'm trying to find the rest of your bio here, Kayla. Just take one second. It's good. <laughs> And, and we did mention it earlier, so I think you are familiar with Kayla, who gave an earlier lightning talk, and we'll be giving another lightning talk during this panel presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our per first presenter, which is Brandon Moody with Charlotte County. Oh, no, it's Chris Anastasio. Sorry. Am I first? 
schedule, schedule change, I, apparently. Uh, I'll go first, I don't care. Chris Anastasio looks like he's up first. Right. <laughs> Thank you for being uh, flexible here. Actually, and I'll I'm going to stand up if that's okay. Yeah, you're welcome to come over here if you'd like. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome back from lunch. Uh, so I guess I'm going to kick this off uh, with a discussion on water quality in the Charlotte Harbor watershed uh, following uh, Hurricane Ian. And so th this talk is going to be kind of twofold, and, and I think it's going to lead nicely into the rest of the, the conversations that we're going to have today, which is that we're going to talk a little bit about DO dynamics and what happened uh, before and after Hurricane Ian. But the other really underlying point of, of this talk is really to showcase the coordination and the effort that went into um, a, this unified approach to water quality response after Hurricane Ian, and hopefully kind of get everybody thinking about what we're going to do for the next one, because we all know there will be a next storm. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind while we're, while we're going through all of these talks. So I'm going to focus on DO and specifically hypoxia. So most of you know what hypoxia is, for those of you who don't. Um, it is basically when dissolved oxygen concentrations in the water column uh, remain below two to three milligrams per liter. So um, according to IFAS, the optimum <coughs> health for warm water fish, so basically those in Florida, is generally uh, greater than or equal to about five milligrams per liter uh, of dissolved oxygen, and, and typically when, you, when your dissolved oxygen concentrations fall below two for a long period of time, that's when you start to see these fish kills like the picture that you see uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. So this was a big concern of ours um, in the days leading up to and then, of course, following Hurricane Ian was what impact um, there might be on hypoxia because, as you all remember, there was a ton of rainfall a 500-year flood event, lots and lots of rain was dumped on the watershed and uh, ultimately made its way down into Charlotte Harbor and the adjacent estuary. So we were kind of worried about what was going to happen with respect to hypoxia. And then one of the reasons why uh, we were concerned about that was because of some experience that we had uh, with Charlie. So this is a, a, an image of the tracks of both Hurricane Charlie in 2004 and Hurricane Ian in 2022. And um, you can see they're quite similar. And so uh, these are the uh, radar images of both Charlie on the left and Ian on the right. And again, the similarities are, are pretty striking from just these pictures alone. So um, the storms were very similar, but they were not similar too. So there was a lot of both similarities and dissimilarities. So obviously we just showed you the track, um, the intensities were somewhat similar, and the landfall location was eerily similar right around Cayo Costa, at least the first landfall. Um, but there were also many differences between these two storms. So Ian, as we all know, was much larger than Charlie. Um, it uh, moved slower than Charlie. And, you know, we had, because it was such a massive storm, there was a larger storm surge, larger wind field, and the rainfall totals were much greater as well. So while these storms are very similar, they were also very different. And so we started talking about the need to go out and capture some of this dissolved oxygen data to see what the impacts of Ian were. Now, fortunately, uh, well, not fortunately, uh, unfortunately, in 2004, it was a very busy year for storms. So we not only had Charlie, but we also then had Francis and Jean. And Ivan kind of made a glancing blow along our, our uh, peninsula west coast, but did a lot of damage in the panhandle. Um, what came of Charlie was uh, a paper that we published back in uh, 2006. And so a lot of the discussion that we had going into this post-Ian recovery was sparked based on the work that we did back in 2004 after Charlie. And, and this was the paper that was published uh, by Tomasco, uh, myself, and Charles Kovich in 2006, which was the results of that information. And basically, what we were trying to do is figure out what, what was the DO uh, recovery like after Charlie. And so, Basically, the conclusion of that work was that after about two to three months, we saw dissolved oxygen levels in the Peace River um, go back to what, what they were prior to the passage of Hurricane Charlie. So this all started this conversation that, well, we would like to see what this impact is in Ian, because the hypothesis anyway was that given the, the, the larger size of Ian, the more rainfall, and the fact that our antecedent conditions were very saturated, if you all remember before Ian, um, the ground was saturated. You know, the Peace River was, was high. 
Um, our water management district, our, many of our structures and, and our uh, water control structures were already open. We were pushing water out because we had had so much rain in the months that led up to Ian. So it was, it was a, a very uh, potentially bad situation that was setting up, and we wanted to position ourselves so that we could collect these data and make some comparisons to what we saw after Charlie. So that's kind of what drove our conversation. Now, fast forward to about, I don't know, maybe two days after the storm, I get a call from Brandon. And Brandon calls me and says, hey man, I'm getting a lot of questions about water quality in the county. Um, you know, there's first responders that are walking in waist deep water that are trying to save lives and people are trying to bring infrastructure back. But there's also porta potties that are floating by and, and, you know, raw sewage in the water. So I'm getting questions on is it safe for these first responders to be in the water? And so we started having a conversation and, you know, what can we as the water management district do to help collect some of that information? And one big difference between Charlie and Ian, back in 2004, we did things a little bit more on the hip. So after Charlie, you know, you basically jumped in your truck, you went out and you started collecting samples and, and you sent them to the lab. Since then, and really in, in large part due to the lessons that we learned after Katrina, um, we have an incident command s uh, system in place, an ICS. We have a division of emergency management. We have a, an emergency operations center at the state level, at our level, at the district, and of course all the local governments have EOCs as well. So. We're in a much more structured environment than we were in 2004 in terms of being able to respond. So, so I, I talked with Brandon and we decided the best course of action would be then to submit what we, what we call a, a mission request through uh, a platform called Web EOC, which is what you see on your screen. So this is just a, a recent screenshot of post-Hurricane Ian missions. And you can see there was a lot of missions that were completed. There's still quite a few that are still out there. So, you know, Hurricane Ian response is not over, not by a long shot. But this is the central uh, point of, uh, you know, for requesting help from local governments to get help from other organizations within the umbrella of the state's Division of Emergency Management, of which the Water Management District falls under. Um, it's the primary means to get that help. So we started talking about that and our EOC then submitted a mission request on behalf of Charlotte County up through Web EOC, which you see on the screen there, and then the Division of Emergency Management then assigned that task to us and we were then free to work with Brandon and, and others to kind of launch this uh, coordinated effort. Now, this coordinated effort I would say it was still largely ad hoc, and, and if not for the, I would say, near heroic work that the University of Florida has done, uh, Christine Angelini w was the hero uh, in this because she really coordinated all the different entities, including the counties, including uh, Eric's group, Sanibel Captiva, um, God, there, there, was, there was a bunch of them. I'm not gonna list them out because I'll be here all day, but there was a huge effort that was really coordinated through the University of Florida and the efforts of Christine and Miles Medina uh, was a big part of that as well. In fact, this is his dashboard. Um, I think we saw, you guys may have seen this already or you will see this because I think Brandon's got the same, a very similar slide. But what basically we did was we pooled our resources together and we launched a pretty intensive uh, monitoring after uh, Ian. We had crews out about two or three days after the storm's passage. Um, a lot of rivers were not safe to go near, so some of the data wasn't, we, we didn't get to collect until many days after the storm, but um, those were some of the lessons learned that, that we've been talking about and continue to talk about um, this many months later after the storm. So, you know, there was a big effort, and, and Brandon, I think, is gonna talk a little bit more about that. So what I want to do now is really kind of focus on, on the Southwest Florida Water Management District's um, data collection effort. And, and it was larger than this, but given our time constraint, I wanted to focus exclusively on our continuous monitoring stations. And so when I say continuous, it's basically that picture that you see behind the text, that's a data sign. So we, we talked a lot yesterday about continuous monitoring. There's no magic in it. It's basically a data sign. That particular model is an EXO made by YSI and it has onboard dissolved oxygen, temperature, pH, uh, conductivity, salinity, and depth. And so we put these out, and we, we do this a lot, so this is not something new to us, but um, we made an effort to uh, establish these stations as quickly as safely possible 
to start collecting real-time DO data so we could track um, what the DO levels were after the storm and how long it would take for those dissolved oxygen levels to recover. Now, I'm not gonna go through every one of these stations, but I just wanted to show you a map showing you uh, which locations we had these continuous um, data sons. The other thing we did is uh, concurrent with this is we also collected grab samples. So we have a lot more data than just what's on these data sons. We collected nutrient data, um, a, a whole suite of data that was collected at these locations and other locations as well that we're still actually synthesizing. So, but today I'm just going to focus on the DO. So I'm going to take you through these one by one. Um, and this is, uh, we'll start at the very top of the watershed. This is the Peace River at Fort Meade. And so this graphic is showing you two things. It's showing you the sond depth, not the depth of the water column, but the depth that the sond was sitting at. So because we were interested in dissolved oxygen and hypoxia, we wanted to get that sond down close enough to the bottom so that we could really report the worst uh, of the DO in the water column. In some cases, there wasn't much water. In some cases, there was a whole bunch of water. So we had to make sure that that data sun was set in the proper location. Um, and so what you're seeing there is basically the depth of the sun. It's kind of, um, the way to think about it is these, these data sons have pressure transducers on them. And so they're basically measuring depth based on the pressure of the water from the surface. So as that water level drops, that pressure then drops, and so the data sun will report a lower depth. So don't think of it as water, water depth, just think of it as where the data sun is sitting in the water column. Either way, it, it gets the same point across, which is that as that, as that blue line starts to go downward, um, it means the water levels are coming down. So down, blue, blue curve going down means less water in the water column. The red line is the dissolved oxygen. So there's a couple of things to, to see here that I thought was very interesting. One is that, and remember the storm passed on September 28th. So our data set starts on the 10th of October. And again, a lot of that had to do with just safety. We couldn't get our crews close enough to the, to the bridge or to the site where we, we would attach it to something uh, so we had to wait till the water levels receded enough to where we could get our crews in there. But you can see the DO uh, was down at or just below one milligram per liter. That's pretty hypoxic water. So not a lot of dissolved oxygen in the water, even you know almost a week after the storm passed. And then something strange happens, like right around October 18th, 19th, you see this big uptick in dissolved oxygen. So the water level's continuing to, to, to decline slowly, but you see this big, a shift in DO from one milligram per liter up to four milligrams per liter, which is a pretty sharp increase in a relatively short period of time. And then it kind of stays there for a while and then finally goes up uh, to about six milligrams per liter at the end of the period that I'm showing you here. Now our data goes past this point, but I just wanted to focus on uh, the data set to the point where that DO comes back up to what we would consider um, I don't want to use the word normal, but more typical of what we would expect at that location. Now, how do we know that's what's more typical of what we would expect at that location? Well, what I did is I took the period of record from 1997 to 2018, and I looked at the dissolved oxygen data for that period, and I took the average, and then I looked at the standard deviation, one plus or minus standard deviation of the average over that long-term period um, of about 30 years. And I compared it with the numbers that we were getting at, at that site with our continuous DO uh, monitor. And so what this is basically doing is it's kind of giving you a rough idea of whether or not you're getting close to conditions that we would consider more ambient for that location. And so this graph, I think, tells the story really nicely that after about two months, so by the end of November, we, uh, we saw the DO levels return back to what we would consider sort of the more historical average. Um, and that was for Peace River at Fort Meade. So let's take a look at another site. Now we're going to go down uh, the, the watershed and we're going to look at Charlie Creek, one of the tributaries to the Peace River near, near the town of Gardner. And again, a very similar uh, graphic here where you've got your sawn depth rapidly declining after the passage of the storm. You guys remember there was well, probably a month at least, if not more, of no rain. It was very dry after the passage of the storm. So these water levels started dropping quickly. What's more interesting about this, though, is that you see that, that rapid rise in DO again, just like you did 
at, for, at uh, Peace River at Fort Meade. So again, you're down around one milligram per liter, anywhere well, between one to two, so you're still in the hypoxic uh, environment. And then again, around October 19th, you get this, this spike in DO that goes up to about five milligrams per liter, stays there for a while. And then around November 10th, I believe it was, we saw Nicole make landfall. So some of these little blips that you see are related to either uh, isolated rainfall events or Nicole, which did have a little bit of an impact here. You can kind of see that dip right around November the 10th, and then uh, that water level kind of came up, but obviously nowhere near where it was during Ian. And then by about the end of this period, around the 20th of November, we start seeing DO levels going back up uh, well above five milligrams per liter, which is a good thing. But again, the question is, where should the DO be for this location? So we did the same thing. We looked at the historical record from 90, this one was 98 to 2018. And um, again, somewhere around six milligrams per liter is, is what historically is what we've been recording as dissolved oxygen. And so again, it took about two months, a little bit less in this station to get back up to that level. And that's kind of where it stayed uh, through this period. And then uh, if I was to show you the long-term period, and some of these stations, we're still collecting real-time data. So we've got data that goes out you know, many months past November. And those DO uh, concentrations are, are hovering around that historical average. So about two months, it looks like, for this station. When we go down a little bit further in the watershed, now we're in Horse Creek near Arcadia. A um, little bit more flashy. You can see the water levels are kind of going up and down a little bit. But again, you know, you saw a steady decline in water level, um, then an uptick again in DO. So same situation around the same time period, we saw this jump in DO um, from about two milligrams per liter up to over six. And that's where it stayed, and then it, it jumped up to about eight milligrams per liter. So all these stations are showing similar trends, which means these responses are uh, a landscape scale. It's not uh, one site versus another. All these stations seem to be responding in kind. And one, again, when we look at the long-term record uh, for this location, same story. You get DO uh, historically anywhere in the high sixes. And it took about two months before we, we saw that. So we were really surprised, actually, that we saw a recovery of dissolved oxygen at these locations um, as quickly as we did. We, we thought, given the magnitude and the amount of rainfall and the amount of water that was flowing down these rivers, that it, it might take a lot longer than it did for Charlie. The last station I'm going to show you, I think, yes, this is the last station, is Micro River near Sarasota. If you guys uh, know where this site is, if you've been to the Micro River State Park, there's the bridge that goes over that kind of wide area of the Mayaka River where all the alligators hang out and all the tourists like to go and, and tempt fate and, and get pictures really close to them. That's where this location is. And this is kind of an interesting site just because it's, it's relatively deep. Um, and I don't know if that's natural or if it's just a function of the bridge and the construction over time. It's kind of created a bit of a scour. So there's kind of a little bit of a sump. So the, the DO here kind of acts a little strange. As you can see from this plot, it's a lot more jittery. But if you get past the jitters, um, the trend is still consistent with what we're seeing in the Peace River as well, which is that kind of low hypoxic condition up until about October 19th, a sharp increase to about five milligrams per liter, and then um, kind of a, a, a gentle trend upward after that. We do think that that one drop that went from like seven down to three um, around November 11th, 10th, 11th is, is a response to Nicole. So that may be just a localized response. There might have been a lot more rain in that particular localized area than in some of the other areas. Okay, and then that's just the graphic again showing you where uh, the DO is. Again, there's, there's a lot more variation here, a lot, a lot more wiggle, but pretty much we returned to what we would consider to be kind of a, a historical average, um, you know, within a month to two months after the storm passed. So I'm at the end. Um, some of the key takeaways from the DO perspective, um, we were kind of surprised, but the recovery appears to have happened within about two months um, after the passage of Hurricane Ian, and this was consistent with what we found after Hurricane Charlie, which, again, we were a little bit surprised about that. Um, that sharp increase in DO concentration within two weeks after Ian, so I'm going to plug why these kind of meetings are really important, because last night I was having a beer with Brandon, and we were talking about this. And he pointed out something very interesting, which is that, if you guys remember, after Ian, the, the temperature went way down. We had a bit of a cold snap. 
And I remember like being in a hoodie the day after the storm passed with uh, you know, coffee in my hand. And so we think potentially that sharp spike in DO may be related to temperature. The fact that we had a cold, dry air mass come in on the backside of Ian may have been the cause of why we saw the, those DOs uh, come up that high. And then, of course, that dry period, which allowed those water levels to come down, was helpful as well. Doesn't mean that that's going to happen again next time. Things may be very different. So um, it's very important, though, that we characterize these things so that we can take this knowledge with us for the next one. And that's kind of my last point, which is that you know this coordinated approach, which I, I hope we talk a lot more about here as the other speakers come up, is, is really key. None of this could have happened without everyone up here and many of you uh, out here in the stage. So uh, that's it for me. Um, that is my contact information. One last plug, uh, we did, and uh, uh, Jennifer um, indicated that we had this year, uh, in response really to what happened with Ian and, uh, and our lessons learned, we did, we being the Emergency Operations Center of the Water Management District, did establish a water quality response unit. So I am the lead, Trevor Fagan is my, uh, is, is my plus one, and um, we're hoping that moving into, and as we move through the 2023 hurricane season, um, we'll be more prepared uh, than we ever have been before. So that's it, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everybody. All right, and the remote works and does the, uh, does the little, perfect. All right, uh, so kind of piggybacking on some of the information Chris provided, I wanted to, to give a little bit more detail about what we saw, um, not just immediately after Ian, uh, in terms of oxygen and bacteria and nutrients. We're gonna try to hit three big topics in 15 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Um, but also how that compares to what conditions were in this area prior to Ian, because of course that's a big part of the story too. It's not just what did we see right after the storm, but is that really indicative of the storm having impact, or are we just seeing an influence from uh, a chronic issue that was pre-existing? And so uh, you're gonna kinda see that sort of percolate through uh, much of my presentation, but also um, kind of to, to build upon uh, what Chris is getting at the end of his, his, uh, his presentation, uh, a lot of what you're going to see on these slides is a compilation of work from, from many different agencies. Uh, and, and just to, to kind of elaborate on sort of how a lot of this came about, uh, it, was, it was actually during the hurricane, some of us still had cell phone reception. Um, for those of you uh, who are familiar with the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, uh, my wife actually happens to work there uh, under Dave Tomasco. Uh, and so the storm's raging through, and all of our phones are going off, we're getting text messages, and my wife's looking at her phone, and she's being, 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 she's like, huh, it's for you, it's Dave. And uh, it was at that point that Dave's like, so you need to be aware of this, uh, this, this work that we did, post Hurricane Charlie, and let's talk about maybe there's something that we can do to, to kind of get out there uh, and see what impacts Ian might be having. And uh, to Chris's point earlier, you know, there's also that ongoing concern about you know, health and safety. Um, it's not just about bacteria, it's about dissolved oxygen and how that might relate to fish kills, for example. So uh, there was a lot of concern on my part about what we could possibly do uh, to get out and collect data. I was in an actually a pretty fortunate spot at that time because in my role in Charlotte County, I'm not under a department, so I'm fairly nimble in what I can do. And it just so happened, a very minor silver lining, um, that this hit right before the beginning of the new fiscal year. So all of a sudden, I had a budget uh, available to actually do some kind of sampling work um, in response to Ian. And all of this kind of basically built into uh, an impromptu phone conference meeting with a bunch of different groups, including uh, Coastal Solutions on Sunday morning, uh, after the storm, where we're all kind of brainstorming, all right, who has what capabilities, what ramps are open, where can you go, where can you go? Lee County has hit extremely hard. Is there anything that anybody can do down there? Because we're pretty certain Lee County's not gonna be able to get on the water. So um, who can go where, what, who's got what equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and basically came up with a, a, 
game plan uh, to try to capture general conditions as close to uh, the, the passing of the storm as possible, which uh, in our case started around Tuesday. So um, Dave Tomasco and his folks in Sarasota Bay actually went out with Chris, I think it was on, on the 4th, that, that following Tuesday. Uh, we up in, in Sarasota Bay area, uh, I and, and our consultants hit uh, Lemon Bay and then the next day into Charlotte Harbor. And meanwhile, um, Center for Coastal Solutions was doing their part down further south. Um, CHNEP was helping to coordinate as well. Um, this is just, this is not everybody that, that was involved in this effort. This is, uh, and, and I apologize for those that I left off, uh, but it, it grew over the, the following weeks. And, and yeah, Christine Angelini and Coastal Solutions had a, a huge hand in herding all of us cats because they were organizing Friday meetings to kind of go through who was doing what, who was sampling what, what were we seeing, what's next. Um, and, and uh, Miles, again, with the dashboard that, that he uh, worked on to kind of help consolidate the data, uh, it, was, it was a phenomenal effort. That said, there were a lot of lessons learned um, and a lot of things that I think, um, based on, on what happened, that we can build upon and, and do better uh, for the inevitable next go-round. So what I'm going to focus on in terms of the, the data uh, relates mostly to the yellow dots that you're going to see on that map. Um, some of that is Lee County data, some of it's our data, some of it's from the aquatic preserves, um, some of it's part of the uh, Charlotte Harbor Coastal Monitoring Network. I got that wrong, but um, CHNEP's uh, organized monitoring efforts that FWC does. Um, so there's a, a lot in Center for Coastal Solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of individual efforts from different agencies kind of sprinkled in there. Uh, so let's just jump into the data, starting with bacteria. What you're seeing on the screen is a compilation of bacteria samples collected during the first and early into the second weeks uh, of October immediately following the storm. Uh, and, and to try to kind of simplify the, the overall view of what we were seeing in terms of bacteria, um, I've kind of disseminated all this into uh, categories uh, that you see that says below average upper criteria, above average criteria, and above average and upper criteria. That's based on uh, the water quality criteria established for intercoxi and E. coli by the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, there's a mixture up there on the screen of intercoxi and E. coli samples. To keep it simple, I just kind of kept them all as dots, but basically where uh, there were freshwater areas, it was E. coli samples taken um, in intercoxi and in the, the tidal coastal areas. Um, so, but what you can see, and the thing that should really stick out, is that um, a lot of the hardest hit areas was, was really along kind of the Lemon Bay area and, and the Gulf Coast. Um, in fact, we had a couple of spots, uh, I believe here, uh, and it was one of these, that uh, the bacteria levels were so high that the lab reports came back as too numerous to count. So to kind of put that into perspective, um, for one of those dots to be red, uh, it would have to have a count of uh, 130 colonies per milliliter. For it, it to be too numerous to count uh, is uh, well over 24,000. So a huge amount of fecal indicator bacteria coming through the system. Uh, we also saw uh, very high counts in, and unfortunately it didn't show up on the map for some reason, but we were sampling uh, North Fork Alligator Creek up here. Um, we had very high bacteria levels there. We saw very high uh, bacteria levels um, up in, in some of these tidal uh, canal systems that drain into the tidal piece. Um, but by and large, um, the really hard hit areas were over here. Now here's the thing, again, this is what we saw immediately after Ian, but does that really mean that Ian caused what you're seeing on the screen? So what I also wanna be able to show you today is really what we were seeing prior to Ian. So what I've done is I've split these circles into half. And so on the right side of the circle uh, is the, the bacteria as a result that we sampled from around the time right after Hurricane Ian. The left side of the circle is basically the previous five or so months of the wet season leading up to the storm. So in areas where the circle is completely the same color, what that basically means is you really didn't see much of a difference in response. Um, immediately after the storm versus what we had been seeing at that location leading up to it. Um, and, and that's kind of key because you look at some of these spots over here in West County uh, and you see where essentially all Ian really did is exacerbate a pre-existing issue. Um, where in some of these cases, we were already seeing high bacteria counts in these systems. Uh, they were just even higher 
as a result of Ian. And that's important from a management perspective because, of course, my job is taking a look at stuff like this and figuring out what do we need to do, what do we need to target, where are the places that we need to, to address uh, in terms of water quality. And so I need to look at this from 30,000 foot perspective of, of um, how these systems were looking um, pre and post, not just as a result of the storm. Um, you will notice too though that we did have a couple of areas where prior to Ian, um, things were actually looking pretty good in terms of bacteria. Uh, and, and Ian introduced quite a bit of, uh, of fecal indicator into those particular locations. Taking it another step, though, we continued sampling these sites long after the storm. Uh, so I've now split these dots into three pieces into a pie. So on the upper left-hand corner is the, the trend in bacteria leading up to Hurricane Ian. The bottom slice is now the samples that we collected right after the storm. And then the upper right part of the pie is what we were seeing the several months following. So again, where you see solid dots basically indicate where I would argue you didn't really have a lot of impact long term in terms of, of Ian affecting the area. This is in these sections over here, these, these locations, um, we had chronically high bacteria issues. Um, we continue to have chronically high bacteria issues. Um, and then these are the locations that I need to address now in following up and determining what our management strategy is going to be. Um, one thing I do want to point out, uh, a red dot does not equal sewage, okay? A red dot equals high indicator bacteria. And that's step one in the process of understanding impairments of the system. Step two is trying to figure out whether or not those fecal indicator bacteria are coming from anthropogenic sources. So uh, the Department of Environmental Protection kindly offered uh, source tracking services pro bono uh, to limited capacity to the counties that were affected by Ian uh, in, in the weeks after the storm. So I took advantage of that. Uh, and did some spot sampling around, I think this is Buck Creek right here. This drains uh, the portion of Rotunda West and the neighborhood just kind of northwest of that. We collected multiple samples um, right at the discharge point of Rotunda West and, and leading up uh, and sent that off to DEP and said, okay, what do you see in terms of DNA, in terms of, of markers, what are you seeing in these samples? Uh, and they eventually came back and said, we're actually not seeing a lot of human source markers in here. It's mostly bird. However, we do see a lot of evidence of treated wastewater. The reason why they said that, though, is because they found high concentrations of sucralose. Sucralose is an artificial uh, chemical. Uh, it does not tend to get treated by wastewater treatment systems. It tends to run through and therefore is also found quite prominently in reclaimed water systems. We have a very prominent reclaimed water distribution system in West County, and the way that that reclaimed water is delivered to users is typically into ponds. So, like say a golf course, for example, where you use our reclaimed water, it gets delivered into a pond, they withdraw water from that pond, and then use that to irrigate their, their land. That's still a management concern for me, because if I'm correct, and this is really com coming from reclaimed water, this is now pointing out not a bacteria issue, but a nutrient issue. Because when Ian and other major storms come through, those ponds will fill, they'll overflow, and that's nutrient loading going into the system. We've also been sampling a lot of these reclaimed ponds for the last year and a half or so. Uh, and, and some of them have pretty high levels and concentrations of nitrogen uh, in that reclaimed water. And so while it's great that uh, the county has made moves to uh, transition to advanced wastewater treatment, uh, they've got several of the facilities on the books for groundbreaking within the next few years. It's still going to take a few years for, the, for that construction to complete and for the, reclaim, the nitrogen levels and reclaim water to drop down. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that intervening period, working with a lot of these turf managers, uh, golf course managers, to educate them on what's in this reclaim water and, and the free uh, fertilizer that they're getting uh, basically by, by using it. Uh, one other quick side note, uh, you see a lot of black spots. Um, that's, that was a lesson learned for me. Um, I like to fall on my sword and admit when I make mistakes. Um, those, uh, in those areas, samples were actually collected uh, during Hurricane Ian. The problem was that um, because of the nature of the water at the time the sample was collected, uh, the folks that were doing the sampling pulled a different type of bacteria or had the, the sample analyzed for a different type of bacteria than what they normally do pre and post. And so I didn't want to kind of confuse the issue and mix and match different types of bacteria samples on the same uh, chart. So instead I just kind of uh, colored those black as, as no data. But 
Um, for those interested, that, that data is available for folks to, to take a look at. All right, jump into dissolved oxygen. Um, so this, again, is in the, the couple weeks right after the storm. Um, the, the thing that really stuck out to us are two, two things. Number one, uh, we were seeing a lot of fish kills and oxygen drops in HOA ponds. Um, those little freshwater ponds up here. Now, we had a different situation in Charlotte County than what I think Lee County experienced. Um, uh, Ernesto has a great presentation on this where basically they had such a surge that in a lot of areas their ponds were basically inundated with, with marine water. Uh, and they're probably still feeling the effects of that to some extent. Um, we didn't necessarily have those kind of surges, um, but we did have a lot of influx of organic matter. Um, if you look, we've got uh, some great pre and post pictures uh, of, of Hurricane Ian moving through, and you see just vast swaths of vegetation completely denuded. Um, and as a result, uh, we've got uh, uh, pictures of, of a lot of these ponds with just uh, littered with dead fish. It's, it's really sad. Um, and uh, you can kind of see that whoops, manifested in some of these uh, red dots that you see over here. But the big thing that caught our attention was the Peace River. Uh, so we found, uh, going up and, and doing profiles from basically the mouth of the Peace all the way up to a little bit past the, the county line, um, dissolved oxygen levels were, were near anoxic. Um, even those yellow dots that you see up there, they were closer to the anoxic level than they were hypoxic. Um, and this was really scary because the thing is we were also collecting biochemical oxygen demand samples at about the same time. So we were seeing, and I'm just going to call your attention real first to these blue squares up here. So this is a, a, a quick history from last year of biochemical oxygen demand samples collected in the region, not just tidal piece, but um, throughout the, the Charlotte Harbor region and south and the Clusatchee estuary, all the way up until Hurricane Ian, and then kind of the response in the systems in terms of BOD right after Hurricane Ian. And you can see that jump in biochemical oxygen demand right after Ian. Okay, so I need to go very fast. Um, what this basically means, you see this blue square up here at, at around nine, that means that essentially over a five day period, um, you could lose about nine milligrams per liter of oxygen in the system within which you collected it. So if you only have two milligrams of liter of oxygen in that system to begin with, you're at a very, very high risk of going anoxic. So we were concerned about fish kills happening in the tidal piece very soon. Instead, what we saw was this. Um, by the end of the month, um, much as, as Chris mentioned in his presentation, uh, we had the, the tidal piece completely flipped and oxygen levels were closer to five or six milligrams per liter. And again, there's a couple factors that maybe could be involved. Um, you know, the, at that point in, in late October, uh, peace level uh, water flows at the Arcadia were still pretty high, but they were going down. Um, but we also had this cold snap. And I mean, it was a significant cold snap down into um, as far down as the 50s and 60s from the 80s and 90s prior to the storm. Um, so, and, and really, you can very clearly see in the data um, how quickly the oxygen recovers right after this, this cold snap. All right, so I have just four minutes left, and once again, I've done what I always do and uh, go way too long, so I'm going to fly through this. If you have any questions, please feel free to see me or throw it up on the Minty, and we'll, we'll dive back into more detail on some of this during the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to show you nutrient trends um, throughout the entire region, and this is thanks to um, the data that's collected through uh, CHNEP and their partners with Lee County um, and Sarasota County and Fish and Wildlife. Um, so the first thing I want to point out, total nitrogen. So these are uh, these different colored shapes, and just so you kind of get an idea of what we're looking at, if it's red areas are those in Lemon Bay, blue areas are the tidal piece, Mayaka, and Charlotte Harbor, and green shapes are those in the Clusatchee estuary and, and surrounding estuaries. So what you see is a pretty substantive jump in nitrogen concentrations in the couple weeks following Hurricane Ian. Um, and this, this may seem like you're looking at the graph, may not seem like much, but in some cases, this is a 33 to 50% increase. I mean, and think about, especially in the tidal piece, how much water was coming down the river at that time. So when you think about this in terms of loads, in terms of pounds of nitrogen, that is a lot of nutrients coming into the system. Uh, to make it a little bit easier to, to kind of parse out, uh, a lot of the, the samples that are collected in each region are, are collected on the same day. So if you average those out, you kind of get a clearer picture of that jump. Uh, and, and you can look at it and see how it kind of correlates to the discharges coming down 
uh, the Clusahatchee piece and Myakka Rivers uh, at about that time post Ian. All right, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because uh, Chris has already mentioned it. But again, I want to give a huge shout out to Miles, who did uh, a fantastic job getting a dashboard thrown together with very short notice to help us coordinate uh, and collaborate and figure out where our gaps were and where we needed to go. Um, in terms of lessons learned, though, uh, there was a lot, a lot of work that went on in the background to even make that coordination happen. Um, as a quick example, when you've got multiple different agencies collecting samples, they're using their methodology with their equipment uh, and analyses and analytical methods that they typically use. And when you're trying to mesh all that together quickly, uh, it can be a nightmare. And everybody has their own reporting tools, too. This person uses that kind of spreadsheet, and this person has a PDF and whatever, whatever. So um, one of the things that, that I, I really want to try to work towards is figuring out um, mechanisms and methodologies by which we can all kind of coordinate and center around so that when we're doing a multi-agency response, we all all use this one single methodology and this, this one single process um, so that it makes it much easier and much faster to put the data together so we can have those important conversations. Um, the other thing too, again, I was very fortunate in that the timing and my position was such that I didn't have to go through REOC in Charlotte County to get permission to go do sampling and whatnot because there was a lot that they were dealing with at that time. So I had the autonomy and the ability and the financing to just do what I needed to do in terms of water sampling fairly quickly. Um, that was super, super key, at least in terms of Charlotte County's response. Um, but there's also a need to be able to have those kind of resources at bay. What if a hurricane hits towards the end of the fiscal year, for example, and I have almost no budget, right? What then? So, so really try and secure um, the, the mechanisms that, that can fund this sort of stuff so that it's there and it's available when we need it is huge. And that goes the same for laboratory and analytical support. They were bogged down quite a bit after the storm, if they were even open, um, because we, we had you know, a lot that were closed down on the Lee County side. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a lot that has been accomplished to try to facilitate and make these sort of collaborations easier in the future. We still have a, a good bit of work to do, but um, this is a fantastic group, and, and it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and honor working with, with all of these guys. And so I, I'm confident uh, that we can overcome these challenges and, and really turn this into a, a, a fantastic program uh, for responding in the future. All right. So. Hi, again, okay, uh, so my presentation's on continuous water quality data in Charlotte Harbor and Matlache Pass, pre, mid, and post Hurricane Ian. Um, so as I said earlier, I'm with Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserves, or CHAP, and again, these are the five aquatic preserves we manage. Uh, so one of the ways CHAP keeps track of the health of the aquatic preserves is through our continuous water quality monitoring program. So before Hurricane Ian, we had four data SON stations. Uh, the data SONs are water quality monitoring instruments that take readings every 15 minutes of dissolved oxygen, pH, turbidity, salinity, temperature, and depth. Uh, the same ones Chris were talking about. <laughs> um, so our program started in 2005 when two data SON stations were set up in Matlache Pass Aquatic Preserve, one in the north, MP1A, and one in the south, MP2B. Um, but unfortunately, those pilings got knocked down during Hurricane Ian. A third site, MP3C, uh, was added near the Matlache Bridge in 2009 to capture what was happening in the middle portion of the pass. And this one survived the storm. And then in May of 2021, CHAP added our fourth site in Gasparilla Sound, Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserves, located along the west wall of Charlotte Harbor, so up here. Um, so, um, this one, unfortunately, was uh, knocked down by the storm surge, but I'll talk about that in more detail on the next slide. Uh, so on this map, the sites that survived the storm, the ones I'll be showing you data from today, are boxed in yellow. And then you can also see Hurricane Ian's path in red in relation to where the sites are. Um, and as you'll see, they experienced very different conditions based on where they were located along the storm's path. And this data is available upon request. Uh, so these are the two data science stations I'll be talking about today. 
uh, CHWW1 or Charlotte Harbor Westwall 1. Um, this station can capture data from the Mayaka and Peace Rivers. Um, this station was unfortunately uh, knocked over during the storm, but was able to be retrieved by DEP scuba divers along with its data. And that's a picture from that retrieval. Uh, the second set of data we'll be talking about today uh, comes from MP3C, or the Matlache Pass Bridge Station. So this is where the tidal node for the area occurs, um, and it can receive influence from the Caloosahatchee River and the Cape Coral Watershed. Um, and this is CHAP's only data sun station to survive the storm standing up, so it captured some really interesting data. So this is the data from the Charlotte Harbor Westwall site, ranging from before the storm, uh, September 7th, to two months after the storm, November 30th. So all the parameters the data sun measures are on this graph as a different color. So temperature is blue, salinity is orange, dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter is pink, depth is green, pH is purple, and turbidity is brown. All the parameters are plotted along the left axis, except for turbidity, which is on the right, just because it jumps so high during the storm. Um, so we'll look at these parameters separately, but just as an overview, you can see that, oh, and then, sorry, the red box denotes when the hurricane was in the area. <laughs> um, so as you can see that uh, when the hurricane hits the area, that temperature makes a large drop. Salinity drops, depth drops, dissolved oxygen rises, pH rises, and there's a turbidity spike. So after temperature's initial drop during the storm, uh, temperature flattens out. And this is when we believe uh, the station was knocked over and at the bottom of the harbor. Um, so it does not accurately reflect the water quality at that time. Okay, so this is just the depth data from the West Wall site. Uh, so at the bottom of the y-axis is a depth of zero, uh, meaning the sond is out of the water. So the lower the reading is on the graph, the higher it is in the water column. The higher it is on the graph, the deeper it is. So in green is when the station was still standing, and the gray is when the station was knocked over and then was on the harbor floor. So the site's depth typically averages around one meter, or 3.3 feet, and uh, when the storm approaches Charlotte Harbor, there's actually a negative surge, and the sand is out of the water. Uh, but when the storm surge comes back in, this is when we believe the station was knocked over, and the total depth was 2.3 meters, or 7.6 feet. So from now on, I'll just be showing you uh, the data from before the storm until the piling fell, not any of the data when the sand was covered in sediment at the bottom. So here's Westwell's salinity data. You can see salinity goes from around 10 practical sal salinity units, which is typical brackish water, to around three, which is fresh water. Um, and that jump can be seen here. And then here's Westwall's water temperature data alongside dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter. So temperature is in blue on the left, and dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter is in pink on the right. So during the storm, water temperature dropped from 30 degrees Celsius to 22 degrees Celsius, or 86 degrees Fahrenheit to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite a dramatic change in water temperature for such a short period of time. And then dissolved oxygen increased during the storm from around five milligrams per liter to seven. Okay, so now we're moving a little further south. Uh, so this is all the data from MP3C, the Matlache Pass Bridge Station. So this station remains standing after the storm. So we have multiple deployments where we swap the sound out with a fresh one. That's what these vertical black lines denote. Uh, so there are actually three deployments on this graph. One that captured the storm data, one from a month after the storm, and one two months after the storm. Uh, so during the storm, water temperature decreased at the site and every other parameter increased. So salinity increased, dissolved oxygen increased, depth increased, pH increased, and turbidity increased. So here's uh, MP3C's depth data during the storm. So there was also a negative surge in this area, but not as extreme as the west walls. Uh, the shallowest the water got here was around 0.6 meters or two feet. However, there was an extreme storm surge here, and the sand recorded a max depth of 2.71 meters, or nine feet. For context, the site's depth is normally between one to 1.5 meters, or three to five feet. So here's MP3C salinity data. Uh, so there's a large jump in salinity during the storm, reaching around 35 PSU, which is really salty water, and may be due to a large influx of water from the Gulf. So after the initial surge of salt water, the salinity dropped to around five PSU, which is almost fresh water. 
and then took around three weeks to recover to pre-storm conditions, between 16 to 19 PSU, which is normal brackish conditions for the site during the rainy season. Okay, so here's a uh, Matt Lachey's site dissolved oxygen data. So water temperature, again, is in blue on the left axis. Dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter is in pink on the right. So during the storm, water temperature drops similarly to the west wall site, and dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter increases from around three milligrams per liter to nine, possibly due to all the mixing and wave action and possibly gulf water. Um, but dissolved oxygen drops in the weeks following the storm reaching a low of 0.8 milligrams per liter. Uh, we generally get concerned, as Chris said, when water is under three milligrams per liter, so there was definitely some low dissolved oxygen in hypoxic conditions after the storm. And then there was a cold snap mid-October, um, and dissolved oxygen appears to recover after that. So during this cold snap, temperature goes from around 28 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius, or 82 degrees Fahrenheit to 68 degrees Fahrenheit which is a large change in water temperature, again, for such a short time period, around two days, which may have helped dissolved oxygen re recover more quickly after the storm. Okay, so here's uh, West Wall's data compared to mid Matlache passes. So Charlotte Harbor West Wall and Matlache experienced very different conditions during the hurricane, most likely due to their different locations along the storm's path. Um, however, at both sites during the storm, um, temperature decreased and dissolved oxygen increased. But at Charlotte Harbor West Wall, there was a large initial negative surge and drop in salinity, whereas at Matlache Pass, there was a small drop in depth at the beginning of the storm, and then a larger surge of depth and salinity. So while we don't have post-storm data for Charlotte Harbor West Wall due to it being knocked over, we do for Matlache Pass. At that site, at least for the parameters our SON collects, post-storm conditions began to resemble pre-storm conditions around three weeks after Ian but the biological data can tell a different story. Um, so CHAP will continue to monitor water quality in this area. We already have our West Wall site back up and running, and we are currently working to reestablish our northern and southern Matlache sites again. And we're working with Charlotte County to establish a site on the east wall of Charlotte Harbor. And that's all I have, thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being here for our session. Um, my talk is um, about phytoplankton, harmful algal blooms uh, in the Caloosahatchee estuary and near shore Gulf of Mexico. And um, this project uh, has a number of uh, institutions and, and co-authors that I need to acknowledge. Um, Dr. Ed Flips is the specialty phytoplankton identification lab. Um, Elise Morrison does uh, stable isotope work and uh, Shana Lee does the uh, fluorescent dissolved organic matter work that I'll talk about. Um, and then others involved, um, David Kaplan at UF uh, is, is a watershed modeler and um, Ben Stelling actually is one of the people that um, looks at the microscope, and Lise Montefior and Natalie Nelson at NC State are um, data synthesizers, if you want to think of them that way. Oh, so that's the red tide bloom uh, after Ian uh, off of Sanibel, um, taken by my wife, Holly, who's in the audience from a helicopter, so you can really see um, the, the bloom in full effect there um, off the beach. If you look really close, you can see some of the other damage on Sanibel. So we took a direct hit there, but um, just want to set the stage a little bit. Um, you know, water quality and, and harmful algal blooms are, are a big concern for Floridians. Um, they happen statewide, so we really need to get a handle on our nutrient loads. Um, it's not an easy thing. It's all non-point source uh, pollution. So um, manifests itself in different ways. Um, the most con concerning in fresh water is microcystis or uh, blue-green, other toxic forming blue-green algae as well. 
But um, on the coast, it, it's also uh, drift algae and, and Phil Menace mad algae. Kind of heard a lot about that. Um, we're focusing on this project on water column. Uh, so in the marine environment, it would be Karenia brevis, which is a, the dinoflagellate that causes red tide in the marine environment. Uh, in the middle estuary, there are other dinoflagellates. Uh, and then in the fresh water, it's, it's, um, it's the cyanobacteria. But our approach, I think, here is um, unique in that we're covering the canal, which is fresh water, uh, the entire estuary and continuum of salinity, and then out um, into the Gulf of Mexico. And I'll summarize some of the results from, uh, from some oceanographic cruises that I was able to participate in after Ian. So I don't need to go too far into this, but we have diverted water uh, over the last uh, 150 years, and it supports a lot more people, a lot less wildlife, uh, a lot more um, channelization, flood control, uh, urbanization, et cetera. And really, it's led us to a condition where we're managing algae blooms, uh, and, and we need to be more proactive and figure out the exact timing uh, and, and places where these are happening. I, I think we, we have a pretty good idea of, of it, and, and we're not just collecting data to collect more data. There, there are very specific questions that we're trying to answer, but when you're talking about the continuum of water in Florida from fresh water all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, it's extremely dynamic. So dynamic means it's changing constantly, and you need to have um, you need to have a, a, a good system of, of recording that. So I think Kayla's presentation was, was awesome. It reflects how continuous data is so important. And, and my other uh, presenters before me as well, Brandon and Chris, both showed how continuous data is really important. We've established um, continuous sites in 2007. They record you know, salinity, temperature, depth, DO, as you've heard. Uh, they also... Um, measure things like chlorophyll, optical properties of the water, so the amount of algae in the water. Turbidity, which we fortunately are in low turbidity systems most of the time, um, but after this hurricane, we had some high, higher turbidities. And then fluorescence, uh, fluorescent dissolved organic matter, which is the, the brown stained uh, substance that you see associated with, with fresh water and when it mixes with clear salt water, you get um, kind of a yellowish um, tannic content. And then in some places, we are trying to measure nitrogen and phosphorus continuously, um, and that's been quite a challenge. But I, normally I talk about, um, when I talk to general audiences, why water quality is, um, is important. But to this audience, I know you all know, it, it's, it's much more than for the benefit of the environment. It's quality of life. It's our economy. So um, when we talk about water quality and hurricanes, though, um, now we're, we're sort of in a period where we're experiencing these uh, major disturbances. Um, you know, since in my 20 years and six uh, Har Charlotte Harbor watershed summits, um, I've been through um, three of these. So um, that's pretty frequent. Hurricane Ian, uh, a lot was talked about here, but um, the most interesting is for us and new since the mid-20s was the surge. Um, we had um, anomalies in terms of, of depth of salt water that were, um, in most cases, at our lab, five feet, uh, but in the place a little bit closer to the beach. Uh, in this graph, you can see it's more like, uh, like 10 feet. And then as, as you got over to the beach, or if you've ever been to the Sanibel Lighthouse, you know, we're talking 15 to 18 feet um, in some cases. So a big storm and big surge. So I think it's interesting, and Chris talked uh, a little bit about com comparing different hurricanes and, and what was going on at the time contextually. Um, some of my colleagues, uh, and Paul Julian uh, was here earlier, helped put, put this together. But the, the, the differences between Irma and, and Ian uh, were that the, the lake um, was very full um, after Irma. And 
uh, there was a need to discharge water very quickly for a long period of time. And uh, after that storm, there was nearly three, three times as much water coming through the Caloosahatchee than there was after Ian. And the other thing about uh, the, the two storms is that we were on the other side of the eye wall. So this time, the Mayaka and Peace drainage got most of the water. During, um, during Irma, we were on the opposite, or we were on the water side of the storm. So there was a, a significant difference in terms of the amount of, of volume of water that, um, that came down. So um, just the other, as I mentioned, there were differences in surge depending on how close you were to the Gulf. Um, the, we've recorded through, through our uh, real-time observations um, huge waves in the past. You know, 10-foot wave is it's a big wave in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, well, for Ian, um, we measured a 20-foot wave. And there was other sensors out in the Gulf of Mexico that um, uh, measured a 35-foot wave. So these are just crazy um, wave heights for here. I talked about water level, but th these were the sensors that survived. All of our, all of our real-time or continuous sensors are attached to pilings, so some of the pilings got damaged. Some of the pilings got overwashed with waves, so they stopped working. But uh, for the most part, um, we, we had um, decent uh, data for, for at least four, four sites. And of course, we were all like stretching our bandwidth at where we were, or we were all watching it and updating it constantly because it was updating every hour. And it becomes a really useful tool for emergency operations if you can leave this stuff out. So this, um, this research was um, funded by the EPA through the Region 4 um, uh, grants program, which is a South Florida program. And it was to really look at this question of, um, of where algae, harmful algae blooms form and, and what time of year. And, and it was focused on understanding who the players were in terms of the microscopic algae that's in the water and, and also on, um, on nutrients. And we, you can see here that the, the sites extend all the way up to Lake Okeechobee and um, all the way down out into the, to the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, th there's, there's, a, there's a second um, purpose for, for, this pro for this monitoring, and that was to examine the drivers of harmful algal blooms and water quality. And the way that you do this, and we've heard a number of talks that talk about um, complementary efforts with mo modeling and monitoring. Um, this is one of those efforts. I am uh, not a modeler, um, but I have some really smart people that um, work with me. And, and the models are to explain them. One's an ocean forcing model, three-dimensional from the ocean, that looks at currents, temperature, salinity, mixing, all those sorts of things, and that they use our hourly data to calibrate. The second part of this is the watershed model, which um, Dr. S. this morning talked about, uh, the WASH model. It uh, looks at land use types and gauging stations and uh, evapotranspiration and all that. that so that's being, um, being fed into the ocean forcing model. And then upstream of that, there's uh, a, a colleague that's doing a Lake Okeechobee model, looking at inputs, uh, loading, um, microcystis blooms, algae bloom formation, and how that inoculation process interacts with the watershed and, and the coast, how all that works together. It's a very ambitious project. Um, we started it in 2021, and the hurricane happened right in the middle of it. Um, so we were, um, you know, obviously took, took the opportunity to, to sample uh, around it with help from our friends because we didn't have a bridge um, and we couldn't get to the island unless you were on a boat. And there are very few boats that survived um, the storm and the boat ramps were closed. So that was interesting. But um, one thing that we have noticed, and I'm going to talk about um, some, of the, some of the patterns that, that we see. Um, for NOx, which is a, a, an available nutrient for phytoplankton, um, generally um, it's, it's higher in the, in the winter and lower in the summer. 
Um, so this is uh, winter, summer, and then winter, but then the red line is, is Hurricane Ian. Okay, so the way that these graphs are divided, the freshwater sites are at the upper left, um, the Gulf of Mexico is on the lower left, and then the upper estuary, middle estuary, and lower estuary. Um, the nitrate patterns were all very similar. There was a lot of nitrate mobilized after the hurricane, and it seemed to be, um, it didn't go down. It wasn't a, it wasn't a one-time, uh, one-month kind of signal. It's, it stayed high at all of the locations throughout, throughout the area. So ortho P, um, which is uh, an available phosphorus, um, it was higher, uh, this is where my typo, um, higher in the winter in the canal sites and in the upper estuary, middle estuary, but um, lower in the, in the summer months. So let's see, I'll show you here in this canal. Um, higher in the, in, the, in the wet period, lower in the dry period. Um, so what we don't really see it is a pattern in the marine segments or the, the Gulf of Mexico. It, it, it's kind of just variable throughout the year, maybe a little higher in the summer. Um, but again, we see increases, like bigger stepped increases after Ian than we saw uh, before. And then probably th this is uh, a way of looking at phytoplankton just very generally. It's called chlorophyll, and this is a lab-based uh, extraction technique. Uh, in the freshwater areas um, and in the upper estuary, and to some extent in the middle estuary, so that's these three. The, the blooms happen in the summer when it's warm. Um, there's a lot more day length and sunlight, um, and they're responding to that. Well, in the lower estuary and, and Gulf of Mexico, the blooms are, are happening in the fall, and that's partly because, I'll show you in the next slide, these are being driven by different uh, species and genera of, back, of phytoplankton. So the, the, the marine phytoplankton is, is mostly um, Karenia brevis, uh, in this case, uh, and, and then in the, in the freshwater areas, it's, it can be dinoflagellates, but it's mostly diatoms and cyanobacteria. So this slide has way too much information, but um, these are all um, middle and lower estuary or Gulf of Mexico sites. So we're kind of focusing on the marine environment now to show you that, um, that there was a Karenia brevis bloom that occurred uh, in the marine environment. And that and most of the time things are kind of in the dinoflagellate and diatom world. And, and when you have a bloom of Karenia brevis, it tends to dominate everything. Um, the, the bloom was first detected by satellite imagery on October 18th um, near Venice, Florida. And I happened to be at sea on a ship, so I was able to um, steer the ship up there and sample it. Um, but blooms for Karenia tend to happen in the fall. So there, there's not you know, a connection between red tide and, uh, and hurricanes necessarily. Um, but as Miles' research has indicated, um, stormwater runoff, which we've, we've seen in the last few slides, the nitrogen and phosphorus are mobilized and have stayed high in the system for months. Um, so, you know, it did provide the potential for excess nutrients um, for the bloom to expand in the, in the Gulf. So I'll very quickly uh, go through this. Um, Florida Institute of Oceanography, Monty Graham, uh, and Florida Gulf Coast University, uh, James Douglas, Puspa Adhikari, Mike Parsons, several other people um, involved. Uh, um, our lab at USF, Dr. Hugh, who's a satellite person. We all got this chance to go on a cruise on, in October, in January, and again in April. Um, the image I want you to look at is this image. This is the, the satellite, our real color image um, after the the hurricane, and I, I know there was a cold front because I broke a lot of Dr. Hughes' glassware when the ship on the 16th or 17th that night, I was, of course, like the one that stayed up to, to sample, and the ship was going all over, and, and it was definitely a cold front, <laughs> or some kind of front, a lot of wind. But this is, this is my last slide, and it, it has a lot on it. Um, 
But what I want you to look at are these two uh, heat graphs here. Um, what we notice is that the, the, the start of the red tide bloom, and you can see from the satellite imagery, this was um, where the, the, the bloom patch was detected, was right near um, the Boca, Boca Grande Pass. And at that pass, this is way too small, I'm sorry, but it was right at the junction of where there was biological production and terrestrial production of carbon. So that's an indicator that this feature that was partly a salinity feature, it was also a colored dissolved organic matter feature. It was also the place where the patch of Karenia um, was first detected at the surface. So there's something about that feature. I'm not a smart enough physical oceanographer to know about whether the bloom was just underwater and the, and the inlet uh, and the, all the flood water was pushed out and it suddenly came to the surface right at that point at a front frontal boundary. Um, but it certainly is interesting and we're, we're analyzing uh, data that's just coming back from the labs now on, on isotopes and so on to help us try and figure out this, this um, why this um, front was, was important. And I didn't put my email up there, but um, you can find me at that website. Uh, my name's Eric, and I'm happy to stick around for questions in Menti. Thank you. All right, good afternoon. It's just incredible the amount of work that happened so quickly after this. this event. It's amazing you found that station. That was pretty cool. Yeah. I can't believe that. All right, how do you work this thing? Can you teach me? Hey, wrong way. All right, there we go. All right, my name's Eric Weather. I'm gonna be talking about uh, Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. And um, I'm excited about this conversation. It's, it's uh, particularly interesting because any time a natural system undergoes you know, an, a, an immense amount of pressure, it's an opportunity to identify those weaknesses. And I love that uh, part of this conversation has been around identifying weaknesses both in the environment and also in our response to it and where we can improve. So I think it's really helpful in us thinking about our individual roles as, as you know, family members, but also as agencies and, and how we should all work together in this. So. We've heard FIM data talked about a little bit uh, over the last couple days. Um, inevitably, whenever there's a natural disturbance that results in a fish kill, the question seems to come up, like, what is FWC doing about this? They should be out here counting these dead fish and understanding the impacts. And, and that's my fault. You know, I haven't done a good enough job of, of speaking with stakeholders and people who are interested in this um, question so that they know the answer to that. So I'm gonna to try to remedy that for, for those of you here today and talk a little about our, our program and what we do. And the simple answer is we don't count the fish that died, we, we count the fish that are still alive out there. So I'm gonna talk about how we do that here. Uh, I'll go through a, a fisheries research overview and talk about how we do what we do, why we do it, and what the results are. And then I'm gonna highlight a couple of um, uh, results we had following Hurricane Ian, some preliminary data, and then a little bit about FWC's role in emergency response. So getting into it here, um, this is a timeline of our fisheries independent monitoring program. The FIM program, as we call it, is a, uh, a section in the uh, Fish and Wildlife Research Institute, which is the research arm of FWC. Um, we started our program in 1989, or as my kids think it's hilarious to say, back in the 1900s. Um, and we started in Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor. There was, at the time, an apparent decrease in the redfish populations. And the question was, uh, are there enough juveniles in the system to support an adult population that's undergoing harvest? And there wasn't really much data on, you know, to answer that question. So our focus in the beginning was uh, juvenile fish in Tampa Bay, Charlotte Harbor, using seine nets and trawl nets to go out and collect, collect samples and provide some of that information. I'm not going to go through every one of these dots, but I'll focus on a, a, couple, a couple of them. Anytime. Um, there's black text that indicates a new area that we've gone into, and anytime there's a green text, kind of hard to tell the difference, but uh, the green text indicates new gears we've implemented to answer a specific question. Um, so in 1996, we expanded into Cedar Key. Uh, we implemented a large hall seine net to um, start incorporating some information about uh, adults and sub-adults that use our estuaries. 
Um, then in 2008, we expanded our survey offshore to you know, fill in a data gap about some of the uh, uh, federally managed fish that also use estuaries and move back and forth. And then in 2015, we started moving up into the landscape and, and uh, sampling some juvenile snook habitats. You heard some of that information yesterday morning um, uh, about some of the co uh, coastal creeks and, and tidal tributaries that we sample. So that map in the top right corner, top right corner, yeah, top right corner kind of shows where we're sampling today um, throughout the state and South Atlantic and, and the Gulf of Mexico, so pretty broad scope there. And the reason for such a broad scope is fish do this really annoying thing where they, they won't st sit still so we can count them, right? They're always moving. Um, here's the life history of a gray snapper, which is a pretty typical life history for an estuarine dependent fish, where they uh, spend part of their life offshore as adults and then spawn and the juveniles come in, uh, the larvae come in, settle out in the estuaries where they mature using uh, all kinds of different habitats, seagrass, uh, mangrove shorelines, rivers, creeks, and as they get older they start to move out towards the mouth of the estuary and then back offshore. Um, so in order to answer questions about gray snapper or any estuarine fish that has a similar life history, uh, it takes a lot of effort, right? We've got to be in a lot of different areas. This map here is what 800,000 dots on a map looks like. So that's all of our historic samples um, for the state of Florida. You can see how, how much effort that is. Uh, we have to use a wide variety of gears and different um, you know, sampling methods to, to encompass that whole area. So here's the uh, uh, top left corner. You can see a picture of us on our, our favorite gear, the Mosquito Helicopter. It's pretty convenient. It just picks you up and drops you off right at the site. Um, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and then there's the mullet skiff next to that, which we do a lot of our inshore sampling with. Uh, Multi-day and multi-week offshore vessels were aboard. Um, in the backwater areas, we're using small seine nets in shallow water, um, also large haul seine nets. And in deeper water in the estuaries, we're using a small trawl, trawl net. Offshore, we use sonar and acoustics, large trawl nets, uh, underwater cameras, hook gear, a wide array of, of gear across that rainbow of different water colors we're in. So here's the, an example of what our month or what our effort is um, as far as our site distribution. So on the left side, there's our monthly sampling distribution for um, an example month for the Charlotte Harbor estuary. And you can see we're trying to, to sample this entire estuary in a single month and, and kind of get a picture of what's going on there. But it's really uh, it's spread out, right? Not, not a high intensity sampling on a monthly basis. But after a year, when all these um, samples are compiled together, you can see we have a pretty good intensity there. So that gives us a lot better power to look at you know, maybe subtle changes in fish population trends after a year of sampling. So, so keep that in mind. We are a monthly sampling design, but we, uh, we analyze data based on an annual uh, basis there. So at each one of those sites, each one of those dots, we collect a, a variety of different data on um, lots of different habitat information, location, uh, habitat characteristics like bottom type, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, shore type. Um, another key piece of the, the habitat we collect is the, the water chemistry, um, such as salinity, temperature, and DO. Uh, we collect information on weather, and then of course, you know, whatever we catch. And the unique thing about our program is right from the very beginning, we we weren't focused on a single species or a few species that were you know, commercially or economically important, but um, we measured and counted everything from the smallest goby and anchovy up to you know, sharks and stingrays and the sawfish, um, anything we were catching in our net. So we enumerate, measure, collect biological samples on, on many fish um, at every single site there. And here's the main kind of data products that we produce or we were uh, initially designed to produce is inputs into stock assessments. So a stock assessment is a formalized process where a group of scientists compile a bunch of data on a single species and try, um, uh, provide outputs for uh, fisheries managers so that they have some idea of, of how to make regulations. Uh, the top graph there shows the indices of abundance, so that's trends through time of red drum. On the top is the uh, juvenile fish from rivers. In the middle graph is, shows trends for uh, juvenile fish from the bay, and the bottom is a, adult red drum um, from our bay sets there. And the bottom graph shows a, a length frequency distribution of um, redfish at the time uh, that this was taken, see, 1996 to 2020. Uh, on the left is all the state fish that we provide these indices of abundance and length frequency information for. On the right is all the federal, federally managed fish that we provide these for, so a large suite of species. 
Um, we also provide indices of abundance for some of the new regional management approaches that uh, Department of Marine Fisheries Management is, is implementing um, for redfish. You know, they're looking at a, a suite of different uh, indicators for species to make annual decisions on, on fishing regulations. And one of those pieces of information is, is these indices of abundance or trends through time. Um, they also incorporate things like habitat and angler, you know, what, the, what fishermen are seeing out on the water. So uh, a really um, new way of kind of managing fish for the state of Florida here. So on top of the inputs for stock assessments, lots of other uses for these comprehensive data. Um, uh, these FIM data have been used to locate and define essential fish habitats. Like we heard yesterday, uh, sawfish habitats throughout the uh, Charlotte Harbor estuary, and then um, sport fish habitats, especially juvenile sport fish habitats, have been identified and sort of described through, through FIM data, along with a lot of our other partners. Um, these data can be used to describe life history parameters, so how fish use different habitats and move through time, assessing impacts of restoration projects. A great talk earlier on some of the, uh, was Alligator Creek uh, restoration and how Moat Marine is monitoring pre and post fisheries. We also do the same thing. Uh, one of, the, of our projects ongoing right now is in uh, uh, Robinson Preserve in Manatee County where we've had uh, a few years of pre-restoration monitoring in the ponds there. And those ponds are really unique. They were designed with sport fish habitat in mind. Um, so we're able to do some adaptive management following that and say, hey, we, we need to you know, change the elevations on a couple of these things based on the results of this, this monitoring. So um, that's a good use of our data. And then assessing impacts of environmental disturbances, which I'll get into a little bit today. But here's a, a graph that shows kind of an example of that from, I've, I've labeled the uh, a couple points on there with different colors, red being a red tide event uh, in 2005 and 2018, and blue in 2010 showing a, a cold event that we had in um, southern Florida here. So this shows a trend through time of, of these are juvenile uh, spotted sea trout, and you can see in Charlotte Harbor there, after the red tide in 2005, a little decline, but then it kind of an increase back up to that dotted line shows sort of the, the normalized average through time. Uh, after the cold kill in Sarasota Bay, you see a sharp decline in that uh, fish population, and then uh, kind of continues down in that red tide in 2018, knocked it down again, and kind of back up towards uh, 2020. Um, so that's just an example of how these data can be used and provide to fisheries managers so they can see, you know, not just what, you know, what fish died during an event, but how they, you know, what they were doing beforehand and how they recovered afterwards. Uh, really important to mention that this is not just FWC doing work. We're about 50% state funded and 50% uh, we rely on grants and grant partners to, to help us accomplish this work. So, I mean, this is a huge part of what we do. This is not an exhaustive list, but I imagine most of the agencies and, and uh, universities and private uh, entities in this room are, are on this list. And that's a huge, important part of what we do. And that's already been talked about, so. So now getting into some hurricane impacts and preliminary analysis, I want to emphasize that fisheries data is, is uh, robust and it takes a long time to process and get through the system. Um, so uh, here, you know, we, we, took, we ripped some data out of the QAQC process that we have and, and did some quick analysis to, to provide you all with a sneak peek of what's going on out there, what we think's going on. Um, but these data are not yet finalized for 2022. Um, so the question we were asking was, you know, do the altered hydrologic conditions caused by hurricanes impact fish communities in, in some of the river systems? Um, here specifically, we looked at the Peace and the Mayaka River. Um, reason for that is previous research has been done on those systems from other, other hurricanes. So we wanted to see, you know, again, how, these, uh, how this Hurricane Ian compared to previous storms that went through the area. Uh, we used uh, FIM shoreline um, small seine data, so you can see a picture of that, what that looks like there. So looking at uh, shoreline associated small bodied fish um, for three different study periods, 2004, 2017, 2022, um, June through November. Uh, we're looking at community structure differences, and I'll explain that in a minute, and then the, whatever tax that might be responsible, the species responsible for those shifts in communities, if there are any. Let's get into some data here. So I'll start with water quality. So like I mentioned, at every one of our sites, we take a water quality cast um, and do a surface, mid-water, bottom, or somewhere around that. Um, here's information from both the, or all three of those time periods, Charlie 2004, 
Irma 2017 and Ian 2022 for temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. Now this is an average of that, that water, column, uh, water quality, water column um, for two different systems, Mayaka River being triangles, Peace River being dots for June through December. So you can see the things I want to point out here are following Hurricane Charlie and the salinity plot um, and the Irma plot, you see kind of that return to a, a normal salinity regime of the dry season following the storm. So the red dotted line indicates the, the date of the storm. But following Hurricane Ian, when that uh, passed through, you'd see that water um, salinity was you know, still depressed for a long time after that, um, through the end of the year. The other thing I want to point out is dissolved oxygen, as that's already been talked about a little bit with some of these other storms. But following Hurricane Charlie and Hurricane Irma in the Peace River, we saw a pretty drastic drop, um, almost to anoxic levels in, in the uh, Peace River. Mayaka River, not really affected there. Following Hurricane Ian, we saw a slight drop, not as, not as drastic in both systems, and then a quick recovery um, after, the, after the storm passed. So now looking at some uh, fish community data, so think about each one of the, the points on this plot as we went out into a system, we pulled a bunch of nets and all the species and the number of each species we caught, we averaged that and put it on a plot here. Um, so if we went out the next month and we pulled a bunch more nets and, and all the species and all the numbers of species were exactly the same and we plotted that, it would be right on top of the last point. But if we went out the next month and, and collected all different species, the, the point would be far away from the, from the last one. So the distance between points indicates how different these, what we call fish communities are, how different the samples are. So you can see here, um, the storm went through August 13th. Looks like August 12th for Hurricane Charlie, we were out in the uh, Mayaka and Peace River sampling, um, which is pretty amazing. Um, but yeah, so the, the red circle indicates the next sampling date Remember, this is a monthly sampling program. So the next sampling date after the storm, we went back out, um, pulled, pulled our nets in Mayaka and Peace River, and it looks like not a lot of change in the Mayaka River, but you see a significant um, change in the, the fish community structure in the September sample for the Peace River. Now, this information was published. I've got the full citation down there. I think this, this same, um, uh, the same kind of citation was used before, but this, this volume of estuaries and coast 29.6 is, is all about hurricane impacts. So it's a, a useful um, resource for anybody that, that wants to go look that up. I think there's 20 different journal articles just on hurricane impacts. So I left that in there. But the, um, the unique thing to notice is following, you know, after September, we go into October, I believe is the next month and uh, November as well, you see a quick return back to the sort of those normal community structures. So a pretty resilient shoreline community there. So looking at Hurricane Irma, very similar response, right? Um, Mayaka River being blue, again, Peace River being green. Uh, the storm went through in September 10th, uh, 16 to 17 days afterwards, we were out sampling. It looks like a, a dramatic shift in the Peace River, um, not much of a shift in the Mayaka River and the communities, and then a return within a month back to sort of those normal community structures. Now in Hurricane Ian, a little bit of a different story here. So following Hurricane Ian in, in September 28th, there's the track there. Um, we were out mid-October, which is incredible. Um, yeah, so we went out in mid-October, pulled our nets, and the samples look like they shifted quite a bit for both systems, but not in the same direction. So a little difference there, but definitely a shift. And then again, by November, our samples were right back in that mix of the, uh, the community structures prior to. So. so it shows a pretty good you know, resiliency following these storms in, in all these communities. So when I'm talking about communities, uh, it's important to ask, like, what, is, what do you mean by a fish community? What does that look like? So for you fish people out there, this is a, kind of a typical shoreline, Mayaka Peace shoreline community. Um, you see anchovies, silver sides, um, uh, leather jackets, uh, mojaras, uh, shrimp. That's kind of, for you non-fish people, you know, bait and minnows is pretty much what, what, uh, sh what lives on the shorelines there. Following Hurricane Charlie, the shift in the community, so the impacted site, uh, which was in the uh, Peace River, um, we saw a lot of brown hoplos, we saw um, uh, armored catfish and these eastern mosquito fish in our samples, which was a shift from normal. And then a month later, went back to that sort of normal community. Irma, very similar, the impacted system was um, 
the Peace River again, and we saw these hog chokers and, and uh, channel catfish and eastern mosquito fish in those samples following the month. And then a month later, back to that other normal structure. A little bit different in Ian, where we saw the hog chokers and eastern mosquito fish again, but also seeing some bluegill and uh, Mayan cichlids showing up in our samples. So that was, that was a little bit unique. Um, so keep in mind, the impacted communities for Hurricane Ian were from both river systems. So sure enough, we looked a little deeper and, and noticed that the bluegills and mine cichlids were coming from the Mayaka River samples and the, the mosquito fish and the um, uh, hog chokers were from the, the uh, Peace River samples. So, But again, within a month, back to sort of normal conditions. So I won't go through all this. I kind of talked about it, but the, overall the... The story here is in these, you know, um, lower river uh, shoreline communities, it's a story of resiliency, right? The, the fish are impacted, the communities shift, and then they shift back within about a month. Um, so that's pretty interesting to see. Uh, further research, we're going to continue to do what we do and analyze these data on an annual basis, look at larger scale annual shifts um, and see if there's anything there. We'll look at species specific impacts, especially with some of the sport fish that are managed by the state um, to see if there's any um, changes there or impacts from the hurricane on a, on a larger scale. And we want to also take some time to really dig into these data and look at more localized impacts. Um, we're planning to present at the uh, uh, American Fisheries Society meeting in next April um, some of these uh, this information. So we're going to take some time and really dig into these data because what we noticed um, following Hurricane um, Ian is that we might have seen a little more of those low DO events or a little more um, community shifts in the coastal creeks. Now keep in mind, way back from my first slide on the um, timeline, we didn't start sampling those coastal creeks until 2015. So somebody asked yesterday, what were, what were those systems like prior to Hurricane Charlie? And the answer is, we don't really know because we weren't in there yet. But we're in there now. And so we're gonna dig into those data and see if there's any community structure shifts or lasting impacts from this hurricane in those systems little more complex, complex data system, so we didn't have time to get into it for this, this talk, but more to come. Leave you hanging. So talking about uh, FWC's role in like hurricane response and emergency response, you know, we're, we're a large statewide agency, so um, lots of things going on with FWC. Our law enforcement division, um, you know, they act in a first responder capacity. You see a picture of, of them there you know, taking airboats up, doing search and rescue uh, mission on, you know, a flooded street in Northport. Um, they're working right now on a lot of the marine debris, collaborative efforts uh, to remove derelict, derelict vessels, and you can get some more information on that, iandebriscleanup.com, on that huge effort that's still ongoing. Um, for the non-sworn FWC staff like us, the, the non-law enforcement, um, lots of hurricane impacts to deal with, so we're working on public uh, managed lands, getting those reopened, working with individuals who may have lost hunting or fishing access. Um, stranded wildlife following the storm is a big part of, uh, of what some of our staff do. Um, providing assistance, um, and then most importantly, I think resuming the mission. And that's kind of been the, the story here across the board is, you know, after the storm, we knew that people were coming down to, um, you know, rebuild houses and, remove debris and, you know, put new roofs on, but nobody was coming down to help out to count fish. And, and that's really, that's really our job, right? So we needed to get back out there. And I'm so proud of my staff for just like having that drive and like, you know, no power and it's hot. And we're, we got a, a chain of peanut butter jelly sandwiches going in the office and, and we're just all helping each other out, but getting back out there and getting to work and, and collecting these data so we can analyze the results and provide that information. So if you'll allow me to plug just a couple of the FWC kind of a, a reporting app here. So that's a good place to, if you, if you see impacted wildlife or wildlife vi violations out there, um, that's a good spot to do that. There's also a phone number, 888-404-FWCC. Um, so that's a hotline you can call and report any of those things. We also have a fish kill hotline, um, which is a really, really great source of, of information for us to look at, you know, smaller scale impacted areas when, when there are, is a fish kill that you observe or that one of your stakeholders calls you and says, hey, we've got a fish kill here. That's the place to report that. You can see we've got uh, well over 100 uh, reports uh, on, on average per month. Um, there was about 35 following Hurricane Ian that were directly related to the hurricane. So 
Um, we all had lots of other things to do, and not a lot of people were out on the water, so that, that probably influenced that. But this is the place to send people if, if um, you're getting reports of, of fish kills. Um, so yeah, I think that's, yeah, there we go. guys made it. Last presentation. <laughs> um, today I'm going to be talking about long-term trends and hurricane impacts on colonial wading and diving nesting effort in islands. I'm Stephanie Erickson. I'm with the Estero Bay Aquatic Preserve Office um, with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. To give a little bit of background for the Aquatic Preserve Program, there are 42 located across the state of Florida, uh, four of which are actually freshwater aquatic preserves. And aquatic preserves are sovereign submerged lands that are to be maintained in their natural or existing conditions for the benefit of future generations. So in other words, we manage underwater lands for the governor and the cabinet that are held in trust for the people of the state. Astera Bay Aquatic Preserve is tasked with resource monitoring, resource management, and education and outreach activities. Our monitoring programs include multiple water quality monitoring programs, seagrass, macroalgae monitoring, oyster monitoring, and bird rookery monitoring. We utilize volunteers in one of our water quality monitoring programs and in our rookery monitoring program, which is the program I'm talking about today. Uh, wading and diving birds are considered ecological indicators. And so looking at these long-term trends in nesting effort actually provides a valuable uh, information about the health of the estuary. So I'll start off with a little bit of background information on the program in Estero Bay because that's the aquatic preserve um, that I work in. So bird monitoring in Estero Bay was first conducted in May of 1977 with the assistance of Audubon staff, but it only included brown pelican data. Uh, between 1977 and 2007, uh, the monitoring was conducted sporadically and with various um, monitoring methods. So the Aquatic Preserve recognized this as a data gap and established an ongoing monitoring program in 2008 to document nesting activity of colonial and wading bird species. Uh, we began monitoring during the nesting season, which is typically January to October, but we noticed um, over a few seasons that some of our species were actually nesting outside of that window. So we expanded the program, and now we monitor monthly throughout the year. Uh, monitoring is conducted on both the currently active islands as well as the historically active islands. Wading and di diving bird species that are found on these rookery islands can include brown pelicans, double-crested cormorants, ruddy chigrettes, little blue herons, tricolored herons, Snowy egrets, gray blue herons, gray egrets, yellow crowned and black crowned night herons, green herons, and hingas and roseate spoonbills. So we have a lot of different species. In partnership with the Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserves and Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge, both state owned and federally owned rookery islands are monitored throughout the aquatic preserves in the greater Charlotte Harbor area. And the map shows um, where these monitoring locations are located. Objectives of the program include providing peak nesting effort estimates, monitoring population trends, recording movement of colonies, recording disturbance and fatalities from entanglement and fishing line, and reducing entanglements from fishing line and trash within the bay. Charlotte Harbor Aquatic Preserves, Ding Darling, and Acero Bay staff meet annually and participate in a field collaboration exercise to ensure data consistency within the region. Monitoring techniques are similar to allow for region-wide analyses, and data are included in the South Florida Water Management District's annual wading bird report. Surveys are conducted from a boat and include two observers, one data recorder, and one captain. The primary observer is either a staff member or a longtime volunteer. The secondary observer is staff or trained volunteer. And these observers use binoculars while they're on the boat, and we slowly circle around the island. Uh, we provide a distance, a safe distance, from the island so as not to disturb the birds, because disturbance can cause birds to flush from their nests and this can expose eggs and chicks to predators, um, sun exposure, and other hazards. We document species and number of nests, as well as the nesting stage. And we have three types of nesting stage that we include in our analyses. These are unknown, incubating, and chicks. So unknown nests are adult birds that are on the nest, but they're not in an incubating position, and you can't see any eggs or chicks. Incubating is the adult is sitting on the nest in a crouched position, or eggs are visible. 
And chicks are hatchling birds that are visible in or near the nest. And this includes um, birds that may have fledged but are still being fed or cared for by the adults. So to clarify, we don't actually count the number of birds. We're counting the number of nests. And that provides an estimate of the nesting effort. And because we count nests every month, and because it takes time for the birds to lay the eggs, incubate the eggs, if the young to hatch, and for the young to fledge, um, that's longer than one month. So the same nest may be counted over multiple months. Um, this prohibits us from just adding all the monthly counts together to get the, the top number. So we use peak numbers. And those are calculated by using the greatest number of nests counted for each species on each island. So today, I'm just going to focus on the rookery islands um, that are critical wildlife areas um, that are shown on this map. So the little Estero Island critical wildlife area that's shown on Fort Myers Beach is actually a shorebird nesting location. So that is not um, covered in this discussion today. I'm just going to focus on wading and diving birds. Uh, the critical wildlife areas are established by FWC to protect important wildlife uh, populations from disturbance during critical periods of their life cycle, like nesting. So the rookery islands within um, Estero Bay and Pine Island Sound that are CWAs are marked with regulatory buoys, and public access or activity is prohibited within the marked boundary. So if you look on the left map, I can't do the pointer, but if you look on the left map at the top, uh, Broken Islands, CWA, is closed from March through August. It's approximately 13 acres. Uh, Hemp Key is about seven acres. It's closed year-round. Matanzas Pass is about an acre, closed year-round. Big Carlos Pass is about two acres. It's closed year-round. And Coconut Point East is about four acres, and it is also closed year-round. So we're going to look at some of the long-term nesting trends on these islands, as well as the impacts to the islands, to the islands from Hurricane Ian. And I'm going to start with the Estero Bay critical wildlife areas. So we'll look at Matanzas Pass first. And these photos show both the pre- and post-Hurricane um, Ian states of the islands. And as you can see, the islands suffered se severe impacts to the mangroves on the island, including a loss of nesting habitat from defoliation, uprooting, and breaking of mangroves. But there was also a large amount of marine debris that was deposited onto the island from the storm. It was everything from small plastic bags to large pieces of docks and, and even a vessel. So, um, some of the restoration considerations for this island are that we have to take into consideration that the island is actually owned by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, it's also surrounded by a seagrass bed all the way around the island. And this island is unique in that it's typically active pretty much year-round. So there's a very small window in which we have to conduct the debris removal efforts. Uh, FW, uh, FWC and AP staff actually conducted a joint debris removal effort in December of last year but there was so much debris on the island that we were only able to cover less than a third of the island, um, and approximately 200 pounds of debris was removed. But additional debris removal will be needed outside of the nesting season so as not to disturb the nesting birds. So here's just a couple of photos of Matanzas Pass, just to give you an idea of what some of that debris looked like. Um, the positive note on this is if you look on the left uh, picture, you can actually see a great blue heron up there, and it's on a nest. So some of the species of birds have actually shown some resiliency in the post-storm nesting season, um, and that's a good, good sign. Aquatic Reserve staff have been coordinating with FWC, DEP South District, the Division of Emergency Management, and contractors on the hurricane marine debris and vessel removal efforts within the aquatic preserves. So islands that are worthy of special consideration, such as the CWAs and other wading and diving bird rookeries, are reviewed for potential impacts from marine and vessel removal activities. And as previously mentioned, um, Matanzas Pass, additional debris removal will be needed outside of the nesting season. So here's a peek at our peak nesting graph um, with data from 2008 through 2022. This includes all of the species that are nesting on the Matanzas Pass CWA. If you look at the data, you can see while the peak numbers have varied from year to year, um, they did show an increase in the two years after Hurricane Irma, but then they declined uh, in 2021 and remained a little bit lower in 2022. This island has historically supported uh, 12 nesting species, including some state-threatened species. Uh, and between the 2018 and 2022, the five-year average peak nesting effort was 140 nests. So um, 
The nesting season for 2023 has not officially concluded yet, so the final peak numbers are not out. However, the nest counts have already surpassed um, those counted in 2021 and 2022. The total nesting effort between January and April of this year was 159, which is higher than that five-year average of 140. So that was interesting to see. Um, some of the species do documented utilizing this island include brown pelicans, cormorants, gray egrets, and tricolored herons. The Coconut Point East CWA suffered moderate mangrove dam damage, including uprooting on the eastern side of the island and loss of top uh, canopy and branches. This island was also impacted by Hurricane Irma in 2017 and was in the process of uh, regrowth. Peak nesting data shows an increase in nesting effort up from 2016. And it, um, it looks like there's a crash in 2017, but this is actually um, an error on the graph. So we had a peak nesting effort of 103 in 2016. It actually upticked just a little bit to 105 in 2017. Um, the downward trend in 2018 is accurate. That's 76 uh, nests. And then it went up again and started to decrease a little bit. Nesting was abandoned on this critical wildlife area in 2022, and it's believed that was from disturbance. Uh, unfortunately, the roseate spoonbills that had been uh, nesting there have yet to recolonize this island. So this island has historically supported 11 nesting species. Uh, the five-year average peak nesting effort was 76 nests. But the total nesting effort from January of April of this year is 96. So again, the higher um, the nesting numbers for this three, first three months of this year is actually higher than the five-year average of 76. Uh, some of the species nesting here include gray egrets, brown pelicans, cormorants, um, and black crowned night herons. The Big Carlos Pass CWA suffered moderate mangrove damage, including uprooting and erosion on the south portion of the island and loss of top canopy and branches in the central part of the island. And you can kind of get an idea looking at the picture there. The peak nesting information for this island was that peak numbers increased in 2010 and then crashed. Um, they increased again to a peak nesting effort of 139 nests in 2018 and then decreased again. Nesting was abandoned on this island as well in both 2021 and 2022. However, there was some recolonization in 2022, so you can see a slight uptick in the graph there. This island has historically supported 11 nesting species, including uh, reddish egrets, tricolored herons, uh, and brown pelicans. And the five-year average peak nesting effort is 83 nests. The total nesting effort from this January to April 2023 is 55, or excuse me, 53 nests. So we have not surpassed that five-year average um, to this point. Hemp Key Critical Wildlife Area has been damaged by multiple storms over time, with impacts including major erosion from Hurricane Charlie back in 2004, uh, continued to habitat loss since that time, and erosion and severe vegetation loss uh, post Ian. Restoration con considerations for this island include the fact that it is a federally owned island that's owned by the National Wildlife Refuge. Um, there is an ongoing, ongoing mangrove planting and shell restoration project that was occurring at the time of Hurricane Ian. Uh, fortunately, some of those propagules have survived, so um, hopefully that will continue. Nesting, uh, peak nesting numbers for this island show variation in the numbers, but no year has reached as high as the peak nesting numbers in 2008. Uh, this island is a popular roosting site for white pelicans, and it is it is an historical nesting site for 12 wading and diving bird species, including reddish egrets, tricolored herons, great blue herons, and little blue herons. The Broken Island CWA suffered moderate damage with impacts including defoli defoliation and loss of top canopy and branches. Um, restoration and considerations for this island include the shallow access to approach the island as well as the surrounding seagrass beds. Data show a decrease from the peak in 2008, but it has remained fairly stable uh, in the peak numbers from 2019 through 2022. This island is a popular roosting site for both the magnificent frigate bird as well as the wood stork. It is an historical nesting site for 15 wading and diving bird species, including gray blue heron, reddish egret, roseate spoonbills, and tricolored herons. 
So those are our CWAs that we have in the region. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few other islands that we have that are of interest. The USEPA oyster bar suffered extreme impacts to vegetation, including a lot of uprooting and breakage, and um, to date there's been little regreening on the island. Potential restoration considerations for this area include uh, the shallow access again to, uh, to approach the island and the seagrass that is located on the southern and eastern side of the island. It's also a privately owned island, so any kind of restoration activity is going to have to be in um, communication and coordination with the owner. Peak nesting data for this island showed a decrease from the peak in 20, 2010. Um, and then some variations before essentially um, stabilizing in 2021 and 2022. Shorebirds utilize the oyster bar in this area for roosting and nesting, and the island has, is an historical nesting site for uh, nine wading and diving bird species, including great blue heron, tricolored heron, little blue heron, and snowy egret. Big Hickory Island is one of the more southern islands in Estero Bay. It is not a critical wildlife area, but it, is, um, it was part of a pilot program for marking ed with educational buoys on some of our more active islands um, that are not critical wildlife areas. So in 2022, the annual peak number for this island was 22 nests, and we had six different types of species on, uh, nesting on this island. Cormorants, great blue herons, rosy, roseate spoonbills, reddish grets, black crowned night herons, and brown pelicans. A nesting effort from January through April of this year was 41 nests. So we have surpassed the number, uh, the annual peak number of 2022. However, we, uh, there has been a decline in the number of species that have utilized this island for nesting. Instead of six, we only have four. Cormorant, roseate spoonbill, great blue heron, and little blue heron. But on the positive side, last year we had three roseate spoonbill nests, and this year we had 12. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and then North Coconut, east of M3, is another island that was part of that pilot project for uh, educational buoys. It has suffered severe damage, including a lot of uprooting and breakage of the mangroves. And um, this photo is actually fairly soon right after the hurricane. Um, since that time, there's been some more mangrove uh, deaths on the island, I guess. So it's a lot browner, and there has been little regreening to date. In 2022, the annual peak um, was 75 nests, and we had 10 different species nesting on the island, including great egrets, tricolored herons, snow egrets, and double-crested cormorants. This year, between January and April, we've had 10 nests. So there was a decrease from 75 to 10, and we've only had four different species um, nesting on these islands. black crown night herons, great blue herons, one green heron, and one great egret. So that is a very quick recap of what our Rookery Monetary Program is and some of the long-term trends and impacts from the hurricane. I uh, just want to say thank you to all the Stero Bay, Charlotte Harbor, Ding Darling staff, and all of the volunteers who are involved in the program uh, in acquiring the data and analyzing the data. It's definitely um, a very large effort. So thank you very much. All right, we're going to dive right into our question and answer. Um, I believe we already have some questions that have come in, so I'm going to ask our panelists to just read them line by line, and feel free to grab your mic and respond to any that you would like to. Thank you. I can start on the top left. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it is all fresh, and uh, we don't see too much stratification because the water levels are typically not deep enough for that. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Yeah, I think so. The the question in the the top middle column about do dropping. With Nicole, I think if, if uh, you're referring to the station that was on the Mayaka River, and that was the one that was in the state park, um, that's a really, it's an odd site. Um, you know, going back to the question on, on the top left, as far as stratification, that site at the Mayaka River actually does see quite a bit of stratification, um, just on a normal day. And uh, I didn't really have time to go into detail with that one in my presentation, but um, that one actually does see uh, a, a 
quite a drop off in DO as you go down in depth because it is sort of like a stagnant pool there. And um, that could be, uh, it could have something to do with the DO uh, drop after Nicole. I don't remember what the water temperatures were there too, but I, I suspect that may have something to do with that as well. All right, I'll jump in on uh, the middle one, uh, the, the bacteria samples where it switched from E. coli to Entero. Yeah, to, to give a, just a little bit more information on that and, and why I'm taking the blame on that one. <laughs> uh, so our, our current monitoring program in the county is such that uh, without taking too much time explaining, there are certain areas uh, of the county that are classified as marine or fresh and they shouldn't be. Um, because of the actual salinity freshwater dynamics in there. And so one of the directives, the longstanding directives that uh, our sampling staff have is that in some of these areas where it's not entirely clear if it's really fresh or really uh, marine, to look at the conductivity and salinity and then collect whichever bacteria sample fits alongside whatever that, um, with the, whatever the salinity is telling them. And so. Uh, in this instance, uh, they basically followed that directive post Ian, where there was basically a, a heavy influx of fresh water into those areas where they're normally marine, and so where ordinarily they were collecting intercoxi, all of a sudden, um, right after Ian, they flipped over to, to E. coli. Um, that was something I should have thought about and stopped them before they went out, just, hey, look, just keep collecting whatever you've been collecting in that area so we can do these comparisons. Something for me to, to keep in mind, and then as we refine the program, it's only in its first year, um, so we're, we're basically taking this information from this first year of monitoring, kind of refining and nailing down from here on out, you're gonna collect X and so uh, constituent in, in uh, that stream reach based on what we're seeing before. Also, just real quickly, as a follow-up to this, one thing I do wanna follow up on, because I was going real fast in that whole bacteria conversation, um, I don't wanna give the impression that red dots mean everything is okay. Um, I think that, and one source tracking sample does not necessarily uh, tell you everything that's going on in the area. It takes a lot of samples, a lot of data, and a lot of effort. It gave me a peek and an idea of what might be going on. But one of the things that we're going to be doing, especially, or, or trying to do, especially in the Lemon Bay side that is declared impaired for bacteria, both upper and lower, um, there needs to be a pretty decent effort to do some widespread monitoring and source tracking uh, in that whole West County area that drains into it. So something we're trying to get some funding for now to, to really dig into that, identify where the anthropogenic issues are and deal with it as quickly as possible. So um, hopefully we can get that moving fairly soon. I'll take the question on the center left. So somebody asked about DO and, and what are the processes. Um, you know, essentially when you get that much fresh water and most of it's gonna be organic rich, it's gonna be dark. There's not a lot of oxygen being produced in that water column and it's just a matter of time when you do start seeing as the person that asked the question put at the end there, bacterial decomposition becomes a big issue and so that's where your biological oxygen demand goes, goes way up, your oxygen is used up and, and you know, there's no light coming down into the water column so it gets very uh, hypoxic very quick. Um, you, you know, and just as a follow-on to that, one of the things that motivated us for sampling after Charlie was that we were getting calls from folks in Arcadia saying, you know, the, the air smells like sewage. And, and we got similar, uh, you know, s similar concerns after Ian as well, which is that, you know, people smell sewer water and they assume it's all raw sewage uh, flowing through the river. And while certainly there was an element of that, a, a lot of it is that decaying, uh, matter, that organic matter that just decays uh, as it gets flushed into these river systems. And so we wanted to kind of head that off by collecting some of these data in order to make an informed decision and, and give, you know, an informed answer to folks that were worried about, you know, raw sewage basically flowing into their backyards. Uh, I think this is a question that's going to come up a lot. Is there a place where we can see the data everyone shared today? That is an awesome question. Um, so there's a two-part answer. For um, the, a lot of the pre and post EN data that you saw, that actually came from, um, a lot of that came from either the aquatic preserves or the Coastal Charlotte Harbor Monitoring Network. Um, much of that data is on their water atlas. Uh, and so just, just visit that site. Um, you can download the data that they've collected as well as other agencies. I believe the aquatic preserves data is on there. Um, our data that we collect in the interior of Charlotte County is not yet on there. 
that is a hole I'm trying to fill. I'm hoping within the next, I'm just gonna lock myself in by saying this publicly, within the next two weeks, we'll get our county dashboard up and running. It's, it's in the beta stages, it's been review, being reviewed by a number of folks. Um, I just gotta get my department of one in gear to uh, put the final touches on it and, and get it out there. So uh, once it's ready, it'll be uh, posted on our website and anybody can go on there and look at all of the information we've collected, um, not just around Ian, but before and after. Uh, within Charlotte County over the last year or so and and on into the future I can uh, I, I'd, I'd like to address the top right question about you know what's the, and I don't want to hear from everybody on this one. So, what, like, if you were king of the world, what is the one thing that would help prepare for water sampling response? You know, in any emergency management environment, you know, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. And you know, it is we can prepare, and being prepared is great. But we know that there are going to be issues that are going to pop up. So, what's the one thing that would help prepare water sampling response? I, so, for me, the one thing which I think we are doing just by virtue of being here and having this conversation is, is preparation and planning. Planning is key, um, and that's true across the emergency management spectrum. Um, the more you plan, the more you can be prepared for when things don't go according to plan, and they won't. But I'm curious what you guys think. So I, I, my answer is that I was just amazed at how many people contacted me and offered everything they had to help. Um, sampling bottles, boats, fuel, um, you know, everything. So that was like, we, we had, I mean, our boats were fine, but they were on the island with our trucks and there was no bridge access. And our big boat was fine, but it was being used to move ATVs for emergency responders on and off the island. So um, yeah, for, for me, um, help your colleagues <laughs> that you see that are going through this. I mean, we're all affected on the coast, as, as you know people in the Gulf and on the Atlantic side. Um, when you see, see it, when you're saying, thank goodness that one didn't hit us, but reach out and see if you can help them. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, it's just communication, knowing you each other's needs and what resources we may have available to each other. I think that was that was a kind of a big deal. Like you guys need a boat to get out on the water to your boats, right? Um, so just just staying in communication. I think a lot of that's being done already. So that's a big part. Yeah, I'd, I'd also. Um, yeah. Okay, I'd also include communication with that. Um, like Eric said, access was a real big issue um, when we had the interest in the ability to, to collect water samples, we had a difficult time trying to find a location to get our boats out onto the water. And we actually had to reach out to other organizations and even private institutions in the area to help get us that access until we had uh, more established uh, avenues to get into the bay. Even um, sharing like DI water or ice is like super useful. Like our lab didn't have running water, so reaching out, I think we reached out to Brandon at one point for DI water, um, just so we could start sampling. And I think just to put a kind of exclamation point on, on what we're all talking about, um, remember everyone in this room should be aware, and I know I certainly am, that the, the help and the response after a storm may not come from the area that the storm was hit. In fact, it, it more than likely may be coming from somewhere else. Um, you know, we were fortunate in our district that the n northern two thirds of the district was relatively unaffected. So we had the ability to come into the area and respond. And I think as far as future planning and, and how we see this playing out in, in future events is, is really thinking like emergency managers and thinking the way the Division of Emergency Management thinks in terms of tapping resources that may be nowhere near the affected area. So we have resources around the state that can help in a situation like this. And, and that goes for not only you know, boat assistance and bottles, but also laboratory 
uh, capabilities. You know, we were we were very fortunate that you know we had DEP uh, Tallahassee Lab. Dave Whiting was very instrumental in helping walk us through the process of okay, how are we going to get samples to certain places to be analyzed? Um, bacteria data is a really good example of that, and that you know there was no way we were going to meet the holding times for these samples. So through the guidance from DEP's lab, through Dave Whiting, we were able to uh, you know, make sure it was okay for us to maybe not meet those holding times because data is better than nothing. And so yes, we didn't meet the holding times. Yes, those data are not going to be used for any sort of you know, uh, impaired waters rule uh, because it was a very specific data set that was collected for a specific reason. But the fact that we were able to do that gave us a lot of really important information that uh, Brandon shared with us. So I, I think all of that, all of that to say that, you know, we need to think in a, in, a, in a community that's larger than just our region, that it includes resources that are, are in many cases far away from here. Okay, I'll take the next one. Um, are there any examples in historical data where salinity on the west wall gets as low as it did during the storm? Um, so I'm not sure if it ever gets as low, but it definitely gets close. And uh, the west wall site definitely gets influenced from the Mayaka in Peace River. And during the rainy season, it does um, get, get lower in salinity there, for sure. Um, and then another one, did you all have any stations near Cayo Costa where the storm made landfall? No, unfortunately, the four data sun stations were the ones I showed today. So the, the suds question of what is the composition of white brownish suds uh, present on the surface of Charlotte Harbor? Um, I've, I, I think we've all um, seen this. Um, what happens when you have organic rich water, like these waters are considered black water rivers because of the high tannin content. They have a lot of organic matter, a lot of proteins. And it'd be just like making um, a meringue. You're, you're stirring it up and stirring it up in the wind and it, it creates foam. And sometimes the foams, like thunderstorms, they get together and they get bigger. Um, one of the places where you can really see a lot of foam is on the Pacific coast of, of America where you have an algae bloom in they're being upwelled and they're in the surf zone and they create these 10 foot tall foam balls. But it's the same process, it's just um, on a, you know, on a smaller scale. And a lot of times they're associated with different salinity uh, fronts, they're called. So if you have a high uh, salty water converging with uh, fresh water, it creates circulation that concentrates them into long lines, so you'll see that. Um, one other question that's, that's here, what would you say is the most important parameter when determining where, when an algae bloom will occur? Well, our best tools right now are satellite images or low aerial images. Um, we, we have satellite images every day, every few days, but the problem is that the size of the image um, that, that you can get is, is pretty big, so each pixel is fairly large, and that means estuaries and river systems, especially like the Caloosahatchee, you can't see from the current cameras that um, are in, in, the, uh, in space. They're getting much better uh, with Lake Okeechobee, for example. There's a product that's been developed, um, which is a satellite image that tells you, you know, you can see spots. And when we were on the ship, that was one of the best things. Um, people were sending me uh, images from, uh, from the satellite data, and when we had clear skies, no clouds, and that's a caveat. You have to have clear skies. You could you could see where the patches were starting to form. Okay. Uh, okay. Continuous data was really interesting. Where can we go to find this info in real time? 
Um, so unfortunately for our continuous data, we don't get it instantaneously. We have to go out, get the sound, and retrieve the data. Um, and then it has to be QA'd. Um, so we'll do post-deployment checks to make sure the, the sound was reading okay. Like there was a question about if the intense flow rates could impact how the sensor was reading. And I don't think so. We checked everything. And then we also look at previous and past deployments and compare that data to see how it lines up. Um, so unfortunately, our data is on um, the AP data portal. It's a website you can go to. Um, but it needs to be QA'd for it to go up there. So uh, sometimes it's behind. So I think right now only data up to 2021 is on there. But if you want any um, data, you can email me. And it, it depends, too, on what type of data you're referring to. So there are obviously uh, continuous data, near real-time data sources out there if you're interested in uh, discharge and stage. Um, the USGS, is lo along with uh, Southwest Florida Water Management District has uh, has that data available, so you can you can pull that down. Um, they're not not in the Charlotte Harbor watershed, but we do have some uh, continuous monitoring stations that are linked via uh, our cell carrier to uh, to give uh, near real time DO temperature uh, conductivity salinity data. Um, I don't believe we have any currently active in the Charlotte Harbor watershed, but but occasionally, if it, usually it is a short duration um, data collection effort, and, and we do put that online so you can go out there and you can look at those data uh, in near real time as well. Unfortunately, we are running short on time. Um, I don't know if Mr. Weather, if you could answer one question and then maybe we also see if there's one for Stephanie and then we'll move into closing. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> was there more fresh water for longer from, from storm, from Ian than previous storms? And you know, keep in mind these, each sample we take is at the sample site and we're sampling in tidal uh, systems along the shoreline. So it's possible that it was tidal influence, but it did seem like uh, fresh water was hanging around longer. But again, it didn't seem like it impacted fish communities in there. They still recovered quickly. Um, and after the hurricane, we lost a large amount of our uh, sawfish uh, array, our, our acoustic array out there. Um, so we're slowly recovering uh, information from that and, and trying to see what the impacts might have been on them. But stay tuned, there'll be more information on how, how that storm may have impacted that population. Great, and then Stephanie, there's some questions for you if you wanna pick one. Uh, yes, uh, I see one that was, what was it that disturbed the Coconut Point Island? Um, we're not entirely sure, we're, we've been looking into that, um, but we will be monitoring that in the future. Is it possible that nest counts are higher because it's easier to see post-storm? That's definitely a possibility. Um, we have certain species that, that tend to nest more on the outside of the islands, uh, on the top of the islands, and then we have other species that nest more interior as well. So um, some of these islands that were more defoliated, we can definitely see further into the island and we may be picking up on um, a few more of those nests than we might have prior to. Um, but that'll be information that we will be watching in for future years um, as the mangroves recover and as the populations um, stabilize or increase or uh, decrease. Well, thank you to each of our panelists in the Hurricane Ian panel.